So yeah, I'm Liz Jones, I'm a teaching fellow in geomatics in the Department of Civil Environmental and Geomatic Engineering. And one of the things that I'm responsible for is developing the undergraduate curriculum in geographic information analysis and geographic information software. So that's what I'm um, using for GIS in this presentation. It's looking at the software behind the analysis that we, we carry out. Geographic information software is a very, very powerful tool that allows you to combine lots of different data sets. Um, it has a map based interface, so you have the spatial elements to your data, and then behind these different layers, these different spatial data sets that we have, there are huge databases that give you actually information about the layers that you have here. And you can bolt on spreadsheets, databases, and things like this. You can bring in standard vector data sets. So the common ones that we use are road networks, uh, like building outlines in the UK, locations of schools like we have here. You can also bring in images, so old scanned maps, those that don't necessarily have a spatial reference. It allows you to integrate all of this data into a holistic analysis system. At a very basic level, you can just use GIS to visualise your data. It has quite a nice um, map layout and print layout. You can produce graphs. You can print your, your tables as well. But you can um, sort of move on from this kind of basic use to some quite advanced spatial and 3D analysis. Um, so as engineers, we don't just simply come along and put our designs in wherever we want, despite what some people might think. We want to assess the environment that we're going to be developing our project in, and we want to work out how our design will fit into that environment, but also um, what its impact will be. So some of the key ways in which engineers use GIS is to simply represent their engineering problems, their spatial problems in 2D and 3D. There's quite a powerful 3D engine behind the GIS, so you can get some really good terrain models and run simulations through that way. You can simulate different scenarios. So one of the um, teaching exercises we have is simulating different flood events and looking at how they affect buildings and residences within London. A key thing that we use it for is to decide where am I going to build my airport or where am I going to build my new school according <coughs> to different criteria. So it's a very useful tool for multi-criteria analysis. You have your series of criteria you can, and you have the data that relates to those criteria, you can bring it into the GIS and wait to overlay analysis to work out the optimal location based on the criteria that you have. Another key one is what is the visual impact of my project? Particularly um, useful when you're studying or trying to design wind farms. If you have a 3D terrain model of the area that you're, um, you intend to put your wind farm, and you have some models of your turbines, you can look and run the huge analysis to see what the visual impact will be on the developments as well. So it allows us to get a very good sort of contextual sense of how our designs and how our projects fit in um, to the world, really. And another useful tool is how does your project fit into the existing infrastructure? If I build a new wind farm, how are those turbines, how is the power that's generated? In, those, um, in that wind farm, how is that going to connect into the national grid? If I build a new school, I build a new airport, like it's proposed, uh, that's proposed here, how will that fit into the existing road network? Will we need to build new roads? What would the impact be of increased traffic on the roads that are close to um, the new airport as well? So it allows us to test out lots and lots of different situations. So it's a really good sort of preparation tool, sort of pre-development tool. And the idea really with our undergraduate curriculum is we spend two years teaching sort of through problem-based learning how to use this, these GIS tools and then in their third and fourth years when they're working on their integrated design projects um, and their smaller research projects they can then come back to GIS and use that as part of their um, as part of their workflow and as part of their project. So one of the examples we do in the year two teaching is we look at finding a, a new location for a school. This is from data based in Canada. Um, data that can be input in GIS now is widely available. There's lots of open uh, free data online. In Great Britain, we're really lucky because the Ordnance Survey has put all its mapping data 
online and it's free for students to use that 2D and 3D data set. So here I gave the students the data and gave them the criteria. And so they had to locate a new school that was obviously a certain distance away from existing schools. It needed to be fairly close to recreation sites so that school could use the facilities in the recreation site. The land needed to be suitable for construction, so there had to be a certain slope factor set. And the land had to be available for construction, so you can't just turn up and build a school in the middle of the lake. You can't demolish a load of residences just to put a new school in, so they had to find a solution that fitted in that. So they brought in all the different data sets as layers into the GIS. And just to get a good idea about what the terrain looked like, they took is essentially a flat um, slope layer, and then using the viewshed tool in ArcMap, they could take the Z values, the height values from that layer, and build a terrain model that we can see in plan. Here you can also see that in different views as well, so they've got a sense of the, their terrain. They reclassified each of the data sets so that the information held within them sort of fitted a binary structure. So um, data is either suitable for building or not suitable for building on. And that means that then all the data sets can be combined together in the weighted overlay analysis tool. And then there's, um, in theory, once you hit run, the software will highlight all the areas that match your criteria. So when this tool works, it's really, really fantastic. So it takes a while to build your model. Um, but it can give you some very, very good results quickly. When you've got a very big data set, um, it can save you a lot of time as well. Often when you run this kind of analysis, you end up with several different sites that might fit the criteria, so you can go back to you and you can filter the results that you can get to narrow it down, say, by area, for example. And then when they were happy that they had a small site, they looked at the, the road network that we have here as a, a series of lines, it's a vector data set. And you can carry out cost path analysis, which looks at the terrain and it looks at the existing infrastructure and works out how you can create routes from your new site into the existing network. So it's a very good so just pre kind of pre-construction phase, just based on sort of desktop analysis, you can get a very good idea of some of the things that you'll need to think about in your in your project as well. Another situation that we ran through in the class was developing an onshore wind farm on the Isle of Wight. In this exercise, I gave the students a couple of the criteria. We wanted them to go and find some criteria themselves as well, and then also to find the data sets to match that. So it's one thing being able to use the software correctly, but you also need to think creatively about how you can get the data that you, you need. And the GIS will allow you to modify data sets and create new ones as well. So for the Isle of Wight, they were using criteria such as wind speed, proximity to road, proximity to the airport, um, settlements, they're running some few sheds on that as well. So we have two lectures and two GIS practicals in year one. So the cohort size is about 60 to 120, and we generally take them in two groups, so I have to go and use some of the bigger cluster rooms. In UCL. In year two, we have um, a three week course, so it's three hours in three consecutive, so each week over three weeks. Um, so the first session is always a recap of what they've done in year one, just to kind of give them a bit of a prod about that. And then we move on to some advanced spatial analysis in week two. And in week three, in the past, we used to do some 3D analysis, but by this point, the UCL network was really starting to slow down under the weight of the students using it. Um, so what I wanted to do was look at open source GIS. Um, I have a background in archaeology and because there's no money and no funding in archaeology a lot of people use open source software and use open source GIS and for a couple of years now I've been quite keen but never really had the time to explore open source software properly to see how we could use it in the curriculum. Uh, but this year over the summer I had students uh, to do that. Also in year two, so outside of the kind of standard teaching classes, they have a series of scenarios that run throughout the year. And so they use GIS 
most definitely in their wind farm scenario, they design an offshore um, wind farm, they can estuary. We've also got another scenario that looks at building information modelling. And something that I've noticed, which is really nice over the last year or so, is that the students come and see me now about projects and courses that I didn't necessarily think were about GIS, and it just shows that they are using it as a tool, which makes me very happy. And then in their third and fourth year, the fourth years that are going through now have had GIS teaching from me all the way through, so that's kind of given some adherence to the, the curriculum there as well. So by the time they get into you know, years three and four, they're quite happy to at least go and explore the software. And we also use it in our undergraduate field trips. Historically, we've always used ArcMap software, which is proprietary software by Esri. It's the most widely used GIS software in the commercial practice, so it's really useful for students to get um, experience of this in terms of their employability. However, ArcMap hates being on a network with a, an absolute <laughs> passion. Um, and so for four years I've been battling with ISD because you know, I have 60 students in the cruciform basement clustering and five of them will be able to log on straight away. Some of them will just get chucked out of the software in the middle. So I'm there going, yeah, we've got this really brilliant software and it's going to solve lots of problems for you. You can simulate lots of different things and it's brilliant. And then they sit down and it just crunches sort of slower um, and slower. They released a new version, ArcMap 10, which has some of the glitches um, ironed out. Um, but I just decided that this year I was going to go and have a look at open source software. So I had... Is that right? Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so I had a studentship over the summer for eight weeks. I worked with a fourth well, a student who's in his fourth year now, so he's had lots of experience with the GIS teaching over the summer to explore the functionality of quantum GIS, also called QGIS. I wanted to develop at least one new practical session, a three-hour practical session using it, so that I could replace one of the year two classes, and I wanted to design a new piece of coursework that built on that as well, so that I could broaden the student experience um, but I also suspected that it would run much better on the network as well, and they would have fewer problems with that. So the main advantage of QGIS is that it's free. So everybody installs really quickly, it's really nice. So a lot of our students will go and work on quite small projects and will go and work for charities, but they won't have the kind of funding to go and spend loads on ArcMap licenses. I was a bit concerned that the functionality wouldn't be there, but it, with the studentship, we actually found that there's some really advanced spatial tools in there now. And ArcMap has toolboxes which are all sort of pre-programmed for analysis, whereas QGIS has um, Python <coughs> plugins, so new plugins are always being made available and there's new, um, new tools that are out there for students to use. And so I just wanted them to have that balance of both there. So we now have QGIS installed on the UCR network. It runs absolutely <laughs> Fine. So we're going to continue, or I'll continue to teach using both um, GISs. But for the coursework, what was really good is that I just I set the students a wind farm problem, and I just said, right, I want you to go and design a system that will work in QGIS and in ArcMap that will solve this, and left it very very open and broad to see how the students themselves think about the problem. And the advantages of that as well is that if the students find a new functionality themselves, I can bring that back into the, the teaching as well. Good, thank you very much. Any, <laughs> any questions? Sorry, that's just, just the key gifts practical that we put together. So it's, it's that company who wrote this in the first place and then another, uh, other, other people wrote QGIS? So, yeah. Well, okay. So e um, Esri or ESRI developed ArcMap software and that's probably for about the last 20 years or so they've been working on that. There are different people who manufacture different GIS. Whereas QGIS originally comes from one developer but there's a whole QGIS community now which are developing the plugins. So, so it's going to be supported in the future is it? Yeah. So, okay. And when you do the exercise with them, like the Wimpart one, are they working individually or together? Um, in, the, in the classes they tend to work on their own and I get them to submit what, where they've got to at the end of the session. Um, and then for the coursework they'll be working in groups of sort of two to four. And another good thing about going over to QGIS was that students could install it on their own computers and they weren't having any problems with it as well because around the sort of Christmas period they're getting really stressed out about the 
software not working. So. 